Joining us now to talk more about ISIL's global threat, Warda Khalid, an expert on Middle East policy, and we want to thank you so much for coming in. We keep hearing all these alarming reports of more and more people from the West flooding into Syria and Iraq, uh, several of them from the United States. What's the landscape look like? What do you right, think? Right. Um, well, I mean, it is true that they're overwhelmingly the fighters in Iraq and Syria are from Arab countries or from the region, but we do have a few, was, I think the estimate was about 100 that came from the United States and several thousand from Europe. And I think when we look at the stories of these people, people like Jihadi John, people like other, like the three girls from England who just joined, we see that there is a sense of empowerment or a lack of empowerment that they are feeling, um, and ISIS provides them that. Um, and so we really have to look at the ideology behind these Westerners joining them. Um, people who are, they're either not doing well socially, economically, they have political grievances, and they don't feel a way that they can do anything about it except by joining an extremist group. Gianni John, what, what do you think the significance is that we now know who he is, mm -hmm. we know his background? Um, how does that help, yeah. do you think? Yeah, um, well, I mean, details are still emerging about his backstory, uh, but from what I from what I understand, you know, he had some run-ins with the law beforehand, and perhaps this might have motivated him to take an extremist course. We, we don't know exactly what the details are, but I think, I think it does show us that there is a larger, larger role to play of law, not law enforcement, but we need to be able to look at the various factors and, and make sure that we're not cracking down so hard that people feel that they can't cooperate with law enforcement and they must take an extremist route in order to have their voices heard. We should have a cooperative relationship, and, and I think Jihadi John points to that. But here's a guy who really looked as though he was more interested in being a part of Al-Shabaab yeah. than ISIL. Right. Um, how do you come up with that linkage? It doesn't make sense, does it? <laughs> no, I mean, like I said, people who are looking for these types of outlets, they don't care if it's Al-Shabaab, they don't care if it's Al-Qaeda, they don't care if it is ISIS, you know, they are looking for somebody who's going to provide them validation and empowerment, and this is the key um, when it comes to fighting terrorist threats, is understanding this sense of empowerment that they need, the sense of disenfranchisement that they're feeling, and, and going through a solution in, in that manner. It's interesting, Natalie Carney did a story for us not long ago uh, showing pretty much how porous the, the border is with Turkey. And, mm -hmm. and, we, and, we, and there's been a number of stories about this, people get, transiting into Syria that way. Mm -hmm. And yet now, if there's more of a crackdown uh, on that border, mm -hmm. uh, any sense that these, uh, these folks might be able to get in in a different way? Is there a way to police that at all? Well, you know, when they say there is a will, there is a way. So I think the focus on the border is important, but it is a little bit overblown in that, you know, it's, it's a Band-Aid solution. If we want to solve this extremism problem once and for all, we should be looking at the source of the solution, and that is the ideology. What is the ideology that is causing these people to leave their homes, to leave their countries, and join foreign, you know, a, a foreign brigade in, in Iraq and Syria? Um, you know, it, it's a deep, deep, you know, a problem that that it goes far beyond borders. Let me let me get. We don't have a lot of time, but I wanted to talk to you about the women in the yes. Islamic State mm -hmm. manifesto, which came right. out, which said that girls as young as nine could could marry uh, gentlemen in ISIL. I mean, what were your thoughts when this manifesto came out as a woman? Mm. As a woman, I felt um, incredibly slighted by reading it. I, I felt like this was not a representation of Islam at all. And I felt sorry for the women who are reading it and believing it because it is absolutely not true. Uh, women in Islam have been empowered since the very beginning when even in the Prophet Muhammad's time, women were businesswomen, they were involved in society, they were involved in academics. Even his own wife, Aisha, was a, a renowned scholar who taught men and women. So for a manifesto to come out and say that a woman's place is only in the home and she's not supposed to do anything except raise children to be fighters, it doesn't align with Islam at all. And I really hope that people see that. All right, Wada, Khalid, thank you so much for coming in. Thanks I appreciate for having it. me.